So before we start, let me to get to know you a little bit more. So could you please raise your hand if you kind of a software engineer? Okay, like the most of the audience. And could you please raise your hand if you consider yourself on the management position? Yay, so not so much. <laughs> okay, so we will try to explore the problem of over-engineering in today's talk, but let me first introduce myself. So who am I? My name is Alex, I'm with El Toros, and my primary expertise is web development, infrastructure automation, and machine learning. So what's the problem? Well, you know, over the last several years, I, my friends, and my colleagues were involved in designing and implementing several complex systems. And each of those systems actually incorporated microservices architecture. But you know, uh, not all of these projects were successful. So I tried to classify my experience and experience of my peers and friends to kind of get and understand what did the team did wrong actually, what mistakes they had in their process and why their systems became over-engineered. So yet again, sorry, I just like to make people to raise hands, so could you please raise your hand if you felt that the project you're working on was over-engineered? Okay, yet again, like the most of the audience, I could actually, you know, like merge the questions like, are you a software engineer? Because probably every software engineer felt that. And you can't actually, you know, define probably what over-engineering is. You know, it, it's not easy at least. Some people say like, okay, if it is, if your project does something that you don't need it to do, like has some advanced capabilities, but there are actually more than that. Over-engineered solutions are actually harder to maintain and they tend to cost more. And we are in a Silicon Valley in the land of startups, so imagine how it connects with the startups. If you have a limited funding, you actually can't allow yourself to over-engineer, to be honest. So let's go to the first problem, probably the most common one. It's about ignoring the data. So you know, over the time when I was speaking with the guys who actually designed those systems, I was asking them like, okay, so how do you actually you know, make decisions? How should you split your system into microservices? What drives you? And they're like, well, uh, okay, I know these hotspots like image processing or something, and I just need to scale them so I can extract them. But they sometimes just don't think about how often this feature is going to be used in their system. So they ignore any kind of, I don't know, usage data from their application. And you know, on some stage, I mean, uh, when you're just starting to develop your solution, you just don't have that data, right? So probably, probably you shouldn't do that early, right? If you, if you don't know what you're doing, then what's the point? So I kind of tried to classify like the four primary sources of data you can use when you kind of try to design your application. So the first data source is actually user experience analytics. So how to use that? So you implement the application, at least the beta or prototype, and you start gathering the data as early as you can. That way you can understand what pages do your users use and how long do they stay on those pages, if we are talking about web applications. You can do the same in mobile apps or even desktop apps, so it's not really a problem. So another data source is actually performance, and we engineers, I mean, we actually tend to overuse this one because we kind of expect that some parts of the system will be slow. And we try to use exclusively this reason to drive our decisions. But that's not sometimes true, you know. So that leads us to another data source which is called, well, use cases. Sometimes engineers think that the business is something they shouldn't care about. They don't try to you know, analyze and classify what exactly the application should do. But probably the information about the distinct group of users or applications, or sorry, sorry. But maybe the information on how you should design your system is right there in use cases, in those docs. 
So for example, when I design something, I like to think, can I sell it separately? Try to think about this phrase. So is there a separate product inside of my application? Can it work like separately? Can I bill for it? Is it useful actually? Because you know, when you create some reporting, monitoring something microservice, it's not exactly a product, right? And I'm not sure if it can, you know, develop independently from the rest of the system. And well, that's kind of one of the key points of microservices at all. So if the microservice doesn't have any kind of business value, why should you do that? Why should you extract it? And so the next data source, well, actually it's so common in the way that no one thinks about this, is the source code. So, yet again, if you have your prototype application and you think about, well, so we have this beta prototype, I need to split it, I need to refactor it, I need to make it, I don't know, scalable. And then guys starting to look into the other metrics, but you know, you actually can data mine your source code. You can get the idea of what parts of your code change together. Because, you know, yet again, engineers sometimes create the code which is so intertwined and connected that it might not be obvious which parts of your system are actually dependent on each other. So you have some kind of, I don't know, pricing service, and every time you update prices in your application, you suddenly need to change the UI. So probably you did something wrong, and you can actually extract that information by analyzing the pull requests, the branches. It's actually pretty easy to do. You know, if you know some scripting language like shell or you have some package which has the API for the Git or whatever source control system you use, you can actually do that and visualize that. Well, and no one does it for some reason, so this is crazy. Well, let's, let's check this out. So can you raise your hand yet again if you actually did this at least one time Okay, well, bravo, bravo this one man in blue shirt. He has a beard, so that's probably the reason why he did it. <laughs> okay, so I was talking about this information and stuff, so um, you probably got the idea that, okay, if I don't have the data, what should I do? Well, let's, let's cover the example first. So my friend was working on the banking app. And this is kind of a slice of the architecture there. So they have like much more microservices. But here we see the documents. The documents basically are PDFs with multiple pages. So they have this system which employees use and they upload the PDFs into that system. The PDF goes to API Gateway. The Gateway then sends the data to PDF processor. And what this service does well, he basically processes the PDFs. They extract the information from the documents, like names, contacts, and something like that. Obviously, it uses some bit of machine learning, so it's not so you know, precise. They just gather stats using that system. Then the result is going to streaming API. It's basically a, a microservice with WebSockets, I don't know, endpoint. And the web app is actually connected to the stream API. So let's kind of cover it yet again. You, as employee, upload the PDF. And you can wait on the page, to, on, on the web page, to see uh, how the progress goes, you know? How the data is extracted from PDF, uh, PDF, sorry. So if you have like 90 pages, you're going to wait quite a bit, right? So the architect decided, well, okay, uh, I want to update the page in real time. That's actually quite a useful feature. And the development team, like the dream team, they're like, okay, we can do that. So that was cool. They kind of added, uh, well, Nifty web framework to the web app. So they connected to the web sockets. They extracted the microservice. The code was good. I'm not talking that it was crap, right? So they had the tests. So they had integration tests for the web app, which actually launches it, kind of uploads the document, and waits in the loop until the document is processed to check how the web page is, well, is actually updated. So that was terrific. And then this new information bit came in. You know, the point here is the document will actually take some time to be processed, right? So at least several minutes. 
And the total time actually depends on how many pages do you have in your document. So employees, they weren't actually waiting on the page, you know. The usage data showed that the users spend at most about two seconds on that page. You know what's scary here? Because, you know, how many services were involved in this? I mean, the PDF processor needs to somehow notify the streaming API that, you know, you have, you have some progress on this document, you, you need to update the web page. So also, they have this web application with the web, web framework and they needed, well, kind of a new guy to write it because, well, these were kind of smart backend guys. They didn't know anything about JavaScript. So, uh, and the streaming API web service, which actually came only because of this use case. So yet again, the code wasn't so bad. It was great and they had tests and all that stuff, but well, at the end, they didn't even, even need that. You know, users never saw those, those updates. They were just waiting for the document, you know, they go grab some coffee, they go back and they see, okay, your document is processed. So why should we care about that? And that leads us to another problem when people split their systems or design them from the ground up using microservices architecture. So too early, you know, without having that data. And that's actually, well, pretty common mistake because they think like, okay, uh, I spoke with those sales guys and they told me like microservices are cool. So we need to do that. So we can put the label on the box and say like, we are scalable, we are reliable, we are so, so, so cool. But, you know, uh, in the end, for example, if you look at the backlog of these projects, the backlog is dominated by the technology. Like, how can microservice A communicate with B to do implement asynchronous communication? You know, it's, it's not related to the business at all. So it just, you know, it just siphons the money out of the company, siphons the budget. So it hurts the business. And it's more complex because, you know, if you have those, these juniors, I mean, in your, in your corporation and they come to work on your project, they kind of need to go through onboarding procedure. So they need to know how to launch your system, how to configure it. And you can't imagine how it hurts the development process if the developer just can't deploy this stuff. It's so complex, they just can't analyze how to work with it. They just don't know where the errors are going from. They need to look at all microservices, and this is daunting, you know? And yet again, it kind of kills the whole purpose of the microservices architecture, where you can develop the system in independent manner. Like, every microservice is an application. Every microservice has its own release cycle, its own technologies, its own way of configuring things. So, well, bottoms up, it just slows you down and costs more. So this is pretty obvious. Uh, let's see at another side of this problem. And I could call it, uh, I don't know, too late, but I decided to call it huge rewrite. So sometimes in large organizations, the tech debt accumulates so quickly on the projects that they decide like, okay, we, we need to throw it like away. We need to rewrite it. So yet again, time to raise your hand. So guys, how many of you actually wanted to rewrite the system you're working on from scratch? Okay, okay. I think you're not being honest, to be honest. Because I actually think that every engineer will have this kind of feeling. Otherwise, you're a pessimist, you know. Uh, well, especially at the beginning of my career, I was thinking like, I can rewrite anything. You know, just give me a night, I will do it. But you know, some projects like, I don't know, Windows, try to create an operating system overnight. Well, you can't do that, right? You just can't. But they try, anyway. So, rewrites, they usually don't end well, in my experience. Because uh, the way I like to explain it is this. When you develop a software project, you kind of try to accumulate the knowledge about the domain. Like, okay, if this is a banking app, so what our clients are, what do they do? How can I like make their lives easier? And when you rewrite stuff, uh, you just try to solve the problems created in your code, 
created by the engineers in some way. So if you were hasty, you have some crap, you need to fix it. So if you didn't think about the design, you have some crap, yet again, you need to fix it. So usually when it's all stake game, it's kind of risky because sometimes businesses, you might not believe it, but sometimes businesses, they actually agree for that. It's like, oh, our application down again. Oh, those engineers, they kind of killed it. We need to rewrite it. We can, we can actually allow them to do that. And it can actually hinder the business too. In what way? So for example, business stops altogether, stops the updates. They are not moving with the market speed. You know, They don't add new features. They just wait for you to rewrite the crap that you've created. <laughs> And that's problematic, to be honest, because yet again, if it fails, they just burn down the resources and they didn't fix anything, right? And sometimes when engineers solve the problems created by other engineers, they tend to over-engineer things, like they add more patterns, more abstractions. They kind of enjoy themselves in the way that, okay, this is the castle I've built. But the point is, sometimes the systems became over-engineered and so abstracted that you can't actually move further again. You need to rewrite it yet again. Sometimes you don't have tests. So people who call refactoring, this process refactoring, if you don't have tests, that's not refactoring. There is another word for that. I'm not going to say it. So yeah, let's move to another problem here. Uh, so I have this friend, you know, I like to say I have this friend, so just no offense, NDA and all that stuff. So I have this friend, and he was working on the news portal app. And this news portal, uh, they actually grew in audience quite quickly. So they decided like, okay, we need microservices like right now, we need to scale, we need to kind of improve ourselves. And so yet again, the dream team, was kind of created. The most expensive engineers, like from local market, were kind of gathering and forming the team to rewrite that stuff and implement microservices. But you know, the thing was, what was there is that they didn't think about, you know, ramifications of transferring application to microservices. So, for example, this is how I could summarize the development process. So at the first step, you kind of design stuff or think about what are responsibilities of the service. You try to analyze the requirements, and then you think about how to implement that. Then you actually do that. That's development step or implementation step. Then you kind of test it, probably, <laughs> and then you deploy it. If it's a web app or a mobile app, I don't know, publish it to the app store and something, and it kind of happens again and again and again in the loop. You can argue that, well, that's not how I do things. I have like 80 additional steps, but to be honest, even if we have this argument, I can pretty much convince you that it's just the same loop all over again. And so the ramifications of microservices are here on every step. So for example, during the design step, you need to think, well, what microservice will do? You can't just you know, go to the one folder of your monolith and start writing code. You just, you just can't. You need to create a new one, or you can need to at least think uh, about the responsibilities. Which microservice will do that? And sometimes, you know, meetings, people tend to argue with each other like, OK, which microservice should do that? So another part of this is the development. Remember that junior I was talking about? Because if that junior cannot launch the code, I mean the whole system, or at least the part of the system he needs, and if he can't like clearly understand how to debug it, you know, how to kind of reload the changes, what he should actually update when he changes, well, that becomes a bit of a problem. So the process needs to be obviously documented. And then there is testing. If you have this large monolith, you actually, well, if you're talking about web applications, okay? So you have this web app, you run the test on this web app, you have a single endpoint and you just don't think about it, you know? It's, it's, it's kind of easy. But in case with microservices, uh, probably you want to test them independently. You need to have some continuous integration in place because if you don't, well, you're crazy. <laughs> then you're going, then you just won't understand which service is failing during the release. And yet again, the release or deployment step, what microservice should I update? 
if I change something. So it's, it's not clear because, you know, the release process for the monolith is just let's push the monolith. Let's deploy the monolith so it doesn't change at all. But with microservices, you might have order dependencies like what should I deploy first? If you change the API, you need to make sure that some of the microservices are actually backward compatible with it. So new problems, you should probably think about them beforehand. And so this news portal stuff, the guys actually had some bottlenecks here. They made this crucial mistake, which I would call, I don't know, let, let's not call it by this word. So they had this team lead guy. He was really smart. Well, he is actually pretty smart. <laughs> but, but he was responsible for the deployment of the application. He became kind of a re release manager. And so without him knowing, not even one microservice could be deployed into the system. And they couldn't, just, they couldn't just analyze what microservices need to be redeployed after the changes were made, because they just didn't have a process you know, for separate or independent testing of that. So yet again, I'm not saying that the code was bad or tests were bad. No, 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 these guys were actually amazing, but they just didn't think that, well, if we split our application into microservices, if we will create like, I don't know, 10 or 20 separate applications, they tend to develop independently. And probably if you have, I don't know, if you have some nuclear plant software stuff, you don't want to update it all at once, right? So maybe you should start with the simpler stuff, not, not just, you know, the whole applications in one run. So this is actually pretty complex. So let's, let me finish with the, well, with the latest problem. And yet again, I like to say that it's so common in, in the way that no one does it. I would call it cost-benefit analysis. So uh, how to better describe this? Well, we engineers are actually hired because of our expertise, right? So we are kind of experts in our field. And yet again, it kind of intersects with the fact that engineers don't usually think about the business. Like, what feature will do, what consequences will it have for my client? How it will improve the life of my client and how much it's going to cost? Because yet again, if you will burn all the money and not deliver anything, well, there won't be a company next month, right? So uh, I cannot tell you exactly how you should do the cost-benefit analysis in your projects, but you surely need to understand that when you add a microservice, someone has to manage it, right? Someone has to monitor it. Someone has to deploy it. And Cloud Foundry itself is not going to do it for you. I mean, that's just the platform, and you as engineers are using it, right? So you need to kind of take the responsibility for the actions you do. What features do you implement? Because sometimes, well, management, when I'm leading, I'm just asking like, okay, how, how much time will it take to do that? Like estimates, give me the boundaries. Like management likes to ask that stuff. And they sometimes do not accept no as an answer for the reason that engineers don't usually, you know, involve money in the process. So if you say something like, okay, it's going to cost us like a couple of thousand bucks on the infrastructure, then maybe they will understand that. So you, I can like define the formula for every project, but you surely need to find a way to kind of count the money you spend on the development, the money you spend on maintenance, the money you spend on the deployment stuff. So it will be clear for you if do you want to play this game with microservices or not. Because you know, for the small and medium-sized projects, sometimes these costs, they just, you know, they just, you don't need them. You won't be able to succeed with your projects with it. So with that, let me finish and mention a couple of guys I actually stole some ideas from. So the first guy is named Robert Martin. So uh, the guys from, I don't know, Ruby community might know him better as Uncle Bob. And he gave a couple of talks named Architecture of the Lost Years and the Reasonable Expectations of Your CTO. So they're kind of inspiring in the way that they speak about, you know, taking the responsibility for the code you write, thinking about what ramifications these changes have. Well, and he mentioned cost-benefit a little bit. 
But Greg Young, the guy from the .NET and domain-driven design community, actually speaks about it all the time. So he gave a couple of talks called Stop Overengineering, and the last one, the long, sad story of microservices. So you might not like how he describes the architecture. He may sound a little bit too harsh, but you know, sometimes it's useful to see like this world from the both points, you know, to analyze it, well, what you can do to, in order to improve. So I don't know if you want to write it down or take a picture, you can do that. <laughs> so with that, let's go with the questions. And actually, you know, in order to stimulate you, I have uh, some USB stick drives. I think I have four of them. So let's play a game who asks the questions first, gets the USB stick. Okay, you gentlemen, uh, can we pass the mic? I don't know, uh, okay, maybe I should do that, but yeah. Give me a sec. Okay. What are the guidelines for writing microservices without engineer, over engineering? Okay, okay. So the short answer is don't. <laughs> that's, that's probably the simplest one, because, you know, the only, the only cases where I've seen this to work is when the, the application itself was more, you know, the business requirements were more complex then the overload come in from microservices. So if we are talking about pizza delivery, for example, pizza delivery is probably one of the simpler domains, right? Well, what pizza to deliver? Do you want some additional ingredients? And compare it to the microservice architecture, like communication patterns, how you should deploy it and all that stuff. So I usually measure it by that. So if, for, exa for example, we're talking about some banking application where, I don't know, the loan process, or if we're talking about insurance, something with money involved, like large money involved, these applications, they tend to be like much more complex than microservices stuff. And this is where you can actually like implement it without any issues. Okay, so I promised the USB stick, sorry, I didn't give it to you the first time, but you can have it. <laughs> so the next question. Okay, 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 guys, let us try to optimize it. Can you pass the mic to the next person after you finish? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay, where is the organizer, guys? The over engineer, the microphone. <laughs> now it works. Okay, great. Uh, from your experience, uh, the Scrum approach in different flavors uh, fix this problem or even make it worse? To be honest, it sometimes makes it worse. <laughs> it's, it's not like I, I hate any kind of agile process. No, 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 no. That's, that's not the talk I would like to have. But, you know, uh, to be honest, well, in these kinds of processes, sometimes when people kind of design those things, they tend to collaborate. You know, and sometimes people try to balance the architecture. So if you have like several different people working on that problem, you actually tend to kind of go away from over engineering. The problem is with, you know, highly charismatic individuals which can actually sell microservices to your company, make you do that, but in the end they won't be responsible for the decisions you make in the process. So you will fall into over engineering category. So I hope I answered your question. Okay, so uh, USB stick for you. Let me take it. <laughs> Let me take it. And then, so who's the next one to ask the question? Okay, okay. I'm just uh, collecting the sticks. <laughs> From your experience, uh, how have you dealt with avoiding over engineering and converting a monolith to a microservice scale? So sorry, can we come again? Sure. Um, from your experience, have you ever faced any scenario when breaking down a monolith? Um, how do you, do you avoid monocert? Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Okay, scale? okay. So the question is, when I have the monolith already, how can I try to avoid over-engineering when splitting this monolith to mi microservices? So, okay, let's, let's think about that. Well, actually, the application is really complex, and we have to do that, right? Well, I prefer refinement over the huge rewrites. So, yet again, well, let me show you the first slide. So when you have an existing system in place, you can start collecting data. You have the source code. You can analyze, I don't know, the classes or parts of the system which we're changing 
together. Then you can find those hotspots. They will be pretty obvious, you know, like I, I have this, I want to extract it as a microservice, but the right way to do that is not to extract everything in one blow. You need to extract it one by one and continue to collect the data and see how it affects your system. Does it help you to perform better? Does it help you to kind of, you know, implement changes in your system better? Only that way you will understand if your decision was right or wrong. So if you see what I'm saying. Well, okay, uh, the stick for you. These are actually, you know, big ones, I don't know, 30 gigabytes or stuff, so if it will sparkle your imagination about the questions. Here you go. Okay, I have the last one. Okay. Can you, can you give us your thoughts on uh, the persistence layer? Right? Because that's where we, I mean, we all push state to the persistence layer, things become really difficult. Uh -huh. What have you seen from your experience? Okay, okay, so uh, just take the stick. <laughs> take the stick. So the last stick was given away. And now the question was about the persistence level uh, layer. So how do we fix complexity on the persistence layer? Uh, so uh, how many of you actually heard about the term like domain-driven design? Okay, okay, so lots of hands, like around half. Uh, so the thing is, uh, there is a pattern called the read model. And so what this pattern talks about, well, you will, you will find like different explanations. I actually have this one. So. Uh, this model doesn't actually map to one business entity, you know. The read model is something you can use uh, to collect the data from multiple databases, multiple models into one. So if we think about, I don't know, some kind of a page and our project has users and, I don't know, let's call it mm, cars. So you can create a read model called user car report and this model is going to be built from, oh, sorry, is going to be built from multiple data sources. So you write a separate microservice, or you, or you have this one microservice which is responsible for building those read models. And then, then, you can actually query this read model. This mo read model is not, you know, you don't need to actually to be restricted in what database exactly you want to store it, because it's actually going to depend on your use case. Like, do you have one of a kind of this model, like in the whole application, like a single annual report or something? Or do you need some kind of filtering by ID or flavor or color? I don't know. So basically, that's how I do it. I try to kind of find those models in my application and extract them as read models. So I can kind of abstract the way I can read or query for these models and how I can actually build them, you know, from multiple microservices probably. So this is also also called like query command segregation, if you heard the term. So Oh, actually, yet again, it depends on what is your domain about, you know? If your domain is kind of complex on its own, it's, it actually fixes the problem. Because imagine if you have a separate microservice, I don't know, with a front end just to show that data, and it has like pretty simple backend to supply the data to the UI. So if you make this backend microservice to connect to all the databases in your system or in your project, it's going to complicate the things for the guys who actually support that backend. And you know, sometimes the teams of UI engineers, they actually, you know, support their backend. I mean, the simplest version, like a gateway or something. So you can actually hinder the process for them if you make them to know too much about outline microservices. So that way you kind of provide for them uh, an exclusive gateway, I would say, in the sense that you kind of hide the complexity of the information for them. You just speak with them like, in what form do you want to use that data? How do you want us to collect it? Then you build that model and you're done. Last question. Are we making the API gateway into another monolith? Is, is going to be like the server? Is that the microservice? Surely it's a microservice. You know, you know uh, that, that actually depends, you know, well, look at the large like enterprises or, well, if I can call them enterprises like Twitter or Facebook, they have this one holy endpoint, right, which you're going to. So obviously this is kind of top level gateway API, public facing API. So you may call it a monolith in some sense, but it can actually have, you know, some advanced routing inside of it. 
So it's going to talk to different API gateways in your application. So I usually like to do it this way. If I have like several teams in my project and in complex projects, that's true, they can implement their own API gateways and then we're going to merge them together. I mean, in, in one top level one, if you get what I'm saying. So sorry, I don't have an additional stick for the second question or the third one. So that's not going to work, guys. So yeah. Uh, any other questions for now? Okay, so if I'm not blind from the projector, I just don't see any hands. So, well, let me thank you again for attending to my presentation. Well, I will find you, I don't know, I will be on Altruist booth, so if you didn't hear something you wanted to hear, you can just drop by and we are going to talk about it. So, yet again, have a nice rest of the summit and, well, goodbye. <laughs>